Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Allahumma shahli sadri wa sirli amri wa hlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you all uh, I want to welcome you all to tonight's lecture This is our second lecture of a four lecture part series inshallah ta'ala um, and as is our methodology, uh, in order to move forward with this series, we first must go back. We first must go back and quickly and briefly review some of the content that we discussed in last week's uh, halaqa. Uh, last week's halaqa, uh, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were able to focus on the Islamic perspective of sin the Islamic perspective of uh, sin and we were able to define the term sin that was the first thing that we did is we defined the term sin from within the Islamic context and we essentially said that it is the breaching of the laws and norms laid down by the Sharia ah. so anything that goes against the commands and the prohibitions of revelation then that would be categorized in Islam as a sin. We also then moved on to uh, discuss the different categories of sin and we came to the conclusion that sins in Islam are broken down into two separate categories. We have major sins and we have minor sins. We then went on to discuss the criteria. What uh, qualifies a sin to be major and what qualifies a sin to be uh, minor and we said uh, essentially anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala associates with a punishment a threat or a curse in general um, would be uh, considered a major sin would fall under the category of major sin and we said as for minor sins the default is any other action any other act of disobedience or transgression that does not fall under uh, those uh, specific uh, criteria, then they would be automatically considered to be minor sins in Islam. We also uh, spoke briefly about the, mm, uh, the consequences and the dangers of taking sin lightly. And then we finished our halaqa last week by um, you know, discussing some of the negative uh, repercussions and effects of the sins that we commit. And you know, from them are the weakening of a person's Iman. And then once the Iman becomes weakened, then the fruits of Iman begin to diminish like Taqwa and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also mentioned that it deprives one from Rizq. And it also deprives one from living a longer life. It takes from one's lifespan. We also mentioned that sins lead to more sins. And uh, I believe the final effect we spoke about was sins lead to the spread of uh, evil and corruption and destruction, both uh, on land and at sea. So that, uh, very briefly, was an overview of what we took last week uh, الحمد. now someone may think to themselves man you know all of these negative effects that happen to a person when they commit sin then the question arises why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to sin then why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give man give woman give uh, Bani Adam the uh, you know the capacity to sin. Why? And at times, you know, you may sit down and you may think this after the fact you've committed a sin. Like, why would Allah allow me to do this? Allah has given us free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. And with that free will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, uh, we now have a choice. And there are many, you know, answers and points of wisdom that can be said regarding as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given uh, uh, humanity the, the ability to sin. But the best answer to this question is certainly found in our scriptures, uh, in the Quran. 
And when we go to Surah Baqarah, more specifically uh, verse 30, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having a conversation with the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is having a conversation with the angels. And He says to them, إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِنُ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ اللَّهُ قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Here, you know, this conversation is going on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's informing the angels, I am going to send to earth a khalifa. Or I'm going to send man to earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to all of us as uh, khulafa, right? To earth. And then the angels, they reply, Oh Allah, you know, out of curiosity, not necessarily out of judging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice because they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise. So they, out of curiosity, they say, Oh Allah, you are going to send down onto earth uh, individuals who will only spread corruption, who will kill one another, who will cause bloodshed, and we, your angels, your perfect of creation, we celebrate the praise of your name. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He replies to them, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. That I, Allah, know that which you know not. So that is the main, you know, reason as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to sin, is that He knows and we know not. Allah is the most knowledgeable, He is the most wise, and because of that knowledge and because of that wisdom, with Him He knows the exact reason and all of the wisdoms as to why He has given us the freedom and the capacity to sin. So that is the first answer. That is certainly the first answer to this question. However, we can come up with many wisdom. We can, come, we can count up with many points of wisdom. One of which is simply look at the nature of man or woman and look at the nature of this worldly life. As for the nature of uh, humans, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us weak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Nisa, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Allah created man in a weak state, in a weak state. And many a time we will fall victim to that weakness and that weakness will then lead us to, uh, you know, indulge into sin. So we're already programmed weak and because of that weakness, it will lead us to disobedience and transgression at times. And secondly, if you look at this worldly life, the nature of this worldly life, you know, that's a huge question. Why are we here? Why did God create the world? And this is a very in-depth topic. But from the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the dunya is to test us. And this is often reiterated in the Qur'an. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ 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 To test you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mulk, uh, He says, الَّذِي Referring to himself, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِمَاذَا لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Right? So if the test is about who can perform the best of deeds, then ultimately there has to be a capacity within man to perform also the worst of deeds. And that is the test. And that ultimately is the test. And that's what separates us from the angels. Because why couldn't Allah have created us perfectly? Why would Allah choose to create us perfectly if He already created a being that is perfect? The angels are perfect. They do not have free will. Allah says do, they do. Allah says go, they go. Allah says come, they come. أَمَّا نَحْنُ we, Allah says, pray, uh, yani, we still have an hour. Allah says, give sadaqah, yani, I don't have too much money. Allah says, come to the masjid, well, you know, the roads are bad tonight, I'm going to stay at home. This is the difference. And this is the test. And this is the test. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Another thing we can consider is that it gives Allah the opportunity to 
um, demonstrate to you and I the greatness of his names and his attributes. Remember, go back to this verse here in, uh, in, in Surah Al-Mulk where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the purpose of why he created man or why he gave man life and caused man to pass away. He says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ And look at this last name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an attribute. غفور غفور It has to, he could have chose any name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he chooses غفور Because some days we're going to do أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Right? Some days we wake up, mashallah, we're, you know, the iman is running through our blood, mashallah, fajr is beautiful. We stay up after fajr, maybe we read some Quran, we go to work, you know, we take time, we, you know, recite the Quran, you know, we're being good to those who have rights over us. We feel very, very, very good. And our iman is thriving, best of deeds throughout the whole day. And some days, and some days, it's just tough. <laughs> Some days it's just tough, right? It's really tough to do it, to do that good deed, to get up to pray, to get up for fajr. It's like there's weights holding you down. Sahih? Of course. That's the test, and that's the nature. But Allah is saying, I am Al Ghafur, I am Al Rahim, I am Al Tawwab. I am Al-Afu. Let me show you. If we couldn't sin, how could Allah forgive us? How could Allah demonstrate His mercy? How? So He allows us to sin so that we can praise Him even more and love Him even more. Knowing that you have a God who is going to forgive you when you turn back to Him creates a greater love between you and the one who has created you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, another wisdom from as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows man and woman to sin is because sin can be a means of returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who are going through the sickness, the sickness of sin. And remember, we referred to the sickness of, uh, uh, or sin as a sickness last week uh, by the statement of Qatada radiallahu anhu, where he said, Inna hadha al-Qur'an yadullukum ala da'ikum wa dawa'ikum. Amma da'ukum fadhunub. This Qur'an, it, it, um, it highlights for you the sicknesses and the cure. As for the sicknesses, it is nothing more than your sins. So sometimes we become so sick that we would do anything to find the remedy. Anything to find the medication. And that's why he goes on to say, وَأَمَّا دَوَاؤُكُمْ فَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ وَالرُّجُوعِ إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى As for your cure, and your medicine, it is your returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So someone who becomes so sick, he hits rock bottom, she hits rock bottom, the only thing they have left is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they turn back to Allah. And this is why brothers and sisters, when brothers and sisters who come to the masjid broken, broken because of their sin, or you know, very, very sick because of their sin, you know, we have to treat them with mercy and kindness. And you don't walk into the hospital and, and you'll find somebody who's sitting there suffering from cancer and say, why are you suffering from cancer? Why have you been afflicted with cancer? You would never do that because they're dealing with a real sickness. Similarly, when someone comes to you and they're sick and you can, well, lie, the sickness of sin, you can see it in the people's eyes. You can see it in the face of the people. You can see it in your own face. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and you don't recognize yourself because of the sins that you have committed? So sickness is a real thing. It is a real thing. 
The Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentioned that the, the, you know, the disease or the sickness, the sins, the, uh, you know, the effect that it has on the heart is worse than the effects of drinking poison for the body. So of course you're going to feel pain, you're going to feel weakness, of course. But it always gives you an opportunity to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the other way around. Uh, brothers and sisters, when it comes to life, there are two categories, two groups. Some of you are going to say men and women, right? This is exactly how it's broken into, right? No. There's two groups. And we all fall under one of these two categories. There are those who sin and then choose to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after they have sinned. And then there are those who sin, but then they choose not to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are two people. And there's not a third category. And there's not a third category. And the key word here is choose. You choose. Just as you had the choice to disobey Allah, just as you had the choice to commit that sin knowingly, you also have the choice to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this choice so often in his life. So much so that he stood in front of his companions and he said to them, Wallahi, as reported by uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu an, in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, he says, Wallahi, this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam swearing by Allah, making a qasam. And very rarely will you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except that he really wants to make a point. So he says, Wallahi, inni la astaghfiru Allah wa atubu ilayh fil yawm. In a day, in a day, brothers and sisters, أكثر من سبعين مرة More than 70 times in one day, I, Prophet of Allah, خير خلق الله, خاتم النبيين, me, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, صلى الله عليه وسلم, I turn to Allah in forgiveness and pardon and repentance, more, akthar, he says akthar. And in another narration, it actually says akthar min mi'at marra, a hundred times. Akthar min sab'ina, mi'at marra. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Ask yourself today, and be honest with yourself. How many times did you make istighfar or tawbah today? And I don't mean like after salah, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. That's not what I mean. I mean a moment of complete clarity, a moment of complete, uh, you know, complete just surrender to Allah and say, Astaghfirullah. Like how often, because the Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't just do it, yani haik. Right? He does it in a way where his mind, his tongue, and his heart are all working together when he makes istighfar. It's not lip service. Ask yourself, I ask myself. And that is the standard I hold myself to. And that is the standard that we as an ummah should all hold ourselves to. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of teachers. We learn from this simple, simple statement of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that number one, returning back to Allah is a way of life. It's a daily ritual. Not only when you recognize, but when you don't as well. And we also learn, brothers and sisters, that there's a difference between istighfar and tawbah. Because the Prophet is saying, Wallahi inni la astaghfir Allah wa atubu ilayh. And when they're mentioned together, that means they have to be different. They have to be Different. There has to be components and qualities that separate the two. In today's lecture, inshallah ta'ala, we will cover or we will delve into the 
dimensions of how to make uh, toba. It's different dimensions, it's realities, it's conditions, and it's practice. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Allow us just to first define tawbah. Tawbah, as the scholars have mentioned, here al awda aw al ruju'i illallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al awda, al awda aw al ruju'i. The return of the servant back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And its Islamic concept of returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is due to one's sin or misdeed. And also within this, in addition, it is a direct matter between man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are blessed. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed. There are people who believe that if they commit a sin, the only way that sin can be forgiven is if they go to another man. Not woman, man. Right? Who probably sins more than them and asks them to seek forgiveness on their behalf. Imagine that. You have to confess your sins to man. We would never have forgiveness. I personally would never ask for forgiveness if that was the case. Why should I, a man who is weak, go and seek pardon from God through a man who is just as weak as me? He's no purer than me. He's no greater than me in the sight of Allah. He is a man. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مُطْلَقًا ضَعِيفًا كُلْ إِبْنَ آدَمْ خَطَّاءٌ No exception. وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And that is our relationship with Allah. That if we want to ask Allah for forgiveness, brother, sister, ask Allah. You don't need to tell the Imam. You don't need to tell your mother, your father, your friend. You don't need to tell anyone. It is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a mercy. What a mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa by giving us the ability to directly, without any, any intermediaries, connect with him and ask him to forgive us. What a great blessing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept uh, you know, our tawbah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look past our shortcomings. Number two, the ruling. What is the ruling of tawbah in al-Islam? The ruling of tawbah in al-Islam is very simple. It is fard. It is wajib. Fard ayn too. Meaning it is fard upon every single individual. And sometimes you'll see friends or you'll be in a group with, you know, with some people and they say, well, let's go do this. You know, let's go smoke, let's go drink, let's go out and party. These are the things that people like to do these days. And then you'll say, man, don't do that, man. And, and you know, they're Muslims too, right? Hey, yeah, akhi, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that, man. That's not good, it's haram. And he says, ask Allah to forgive me. Make dua for me, bro. Make dua for me. Ask Allah to forgive me. Akhi, make du dua for yourself. And ask Allah to forgive you. That just shows a lack of sincerity, a lack of care. Completely ignorant of the repercussions of his actions. Every person needs to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a daily basis, as was the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to forgive them and to seek, you know, his forgiveness and to turn to him in repentance. It's your duty. It's my duty. So it is wajib. It is fard ayn. Does that mean you cannot ask Allah to forgive, you know, people who you love? No, absolutely. I ask that Allah forgives you all. And I ask that Allah forgives me. Absolutely. But we still have our own responsibility for our own sins. 
we still have our own responsibility for our own sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ This is in Surah Nur, verse 30. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا No exception. أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ What are you talking about? Mu'min? Mu'min? Mu'min needs to make tawbah, meaning mu'min sins? Mu'min sins. A mu'min sins. But what makes him a mu'min, what makes her a mu'mina, is that she turns back, he turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you can be successful in this life and in the next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا تُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ تَوْبَةً نَسُوحًا Meaning he's not saying only seek pardon and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance, but he is saying, how, how a person should turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is nasuha, in a state of total and complete submission and sincerity. And we will get into that right now, inshallah ta'ala. The scholars, they mention that if you, as a person, as a human, as somebody who is created weak and is prone to falling into sin, how can you, how can I, how can we, as an ummah, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek His pardon. They have given us four conditions. And these conditions must be there in order for that tawbah to be valid and in order for that tawbah to be considered tawbatan nasuha. Number one is regret. Regret over having committed the sin. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he establishes that the first condition in order to have your sin pardoned and forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you carry the emotion and the feeling of regret in your heart. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Nadamu Tawbah. Very simply, he says, regret is the essence of Tawbah. Two words. So you don't forget. You know, well, what's the hadith again? You know it. Regret is the essence of tawbah. This is very similar to another statement made by the Prophet Sallallahu The way it was said is very similar concerning hajj. Does anybody know? Two word statement. Very powerful. Huh? A dua, that's dua al I'm talking, okay, that's very good. A dua, hi al ibad. A dua, hi al ibad. Very good. But during Hajj, al Hajju Arafa. Very good. And why does this, you know, correlate more with the, with the statement, al Nadamu Tawbah? Because if you're an individual who does not stand in Arafa during the proper times of the days of Hajj, then what happens to your hajj? It is not accepted. Your hajj is not accepted. If you cannot make Arafah, if you cannot stand, you know, in Arafah, during its allocated time, then that hajj is uh, incomplete. That hajj is incomplete and it is not accepted. Similarly, if you do not have regret for your action, then your tawbah is also Rejected. And I often use this example with students. I say, if I am punched in the face, for example, very hard in the face, so much so that maybe I'm left with a black eye or a laceration, that's going to leave a, 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 a mark. And then you say, you know what? Giggle, giggle. I'm sorry. Am I going to accept that apology? <laughs> and then you turn around and say, I smacked him real hard. Look, 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 look at his face, he's bleeding. Would I accept that apology? As a person, I would not accept that apology. Why? Because that, uh, that, that, uh, that apology did not carry what? Regret. It did not carry regret, remorse. Similarly, if we continue to commit sins and we have no remorse, 
in our hearts for what we are doing, then how can we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us? How can we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us? It would be very difficult. So this is an action of the heart. This is an action of the heart. You need to have that regret. That's the first step. And then we have number two. The second condition is immediate cessation of the sin. Stopping that sin immediately. Stopping that sin immediately. If one truly feels regret, then naturally they will feel like they need to stop that sin immediately. If you have guilt, if you have remorse, if you feel that pain due to your sin, then naturally you're going to say, you know what, I need to stop now. You know, sometimes you have brothers saying, or sisters, I'll stop when I get married, or I'll stop when I graduate, or I'll stop when I get, you know, uh, a job, or I'll stop after I come back from Hajj. How can you expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you if you constantly, consistently, you know, force yourself to commit this sin? It's very difficult. And the scholars, they also mentioned that the person who gives up this sin because of the negative impact on his or her reputation and standing among the people or due to work or due to any worldly benefit, then that condition of repentance has not been met. Which means that if you stop that sin, it first and foremost has to be stopped because you know that it is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, your wife for years has been telling you, you know, stop smoking. Stop smoking, it's bad for your health. Or, you know, you know stop doing this or stop. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what, sir? You need to stop smoking because I see it's going to be very detrimental to your health. And you say, okay, doctor. Sami'na wa ata'na. And when your wife was reminding you about the amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you of your body, how you spend your money, all of this is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you look past it. But because the doctor says, you know what, you might be affecting your health, you say, that is the reason why I will quit. And not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to preserve, take care, uh, you know, and, and preserve our health. That is not considered nasuha. It is not considered sincere. Right? So, in, this, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is incapable of committing a sin as well, this person does not fall under that category. If you're not able to commit the sin, if you don't have the ability to commit the sin, so you're not able to do the sin, so you don't do the sin, that does not mean you stop the sin. Right? You will still actually be punished for your intention and your desire to commit that sin. Somebody, you know, wants to go out and purchase marijuana, purchase alcohol, they have no money. Somebody wants to steal something from a specific place or from a specific person and they attempt and they're trying but they just can't do it. They will be recorded as if they actually did commit that sin because what refrained them from not committing that sin was not their fear or love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather it was their inability to commit the sin. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that there are four types of people. He describes four different types of people. The first of which is a person who has been given wealth and knowledge. Wealth and knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those people. And that person, they spend and they allocate that wealth in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are the best of people. And then you have a second group of people. These individuals, they have knowledge, but they don't have wealth. So they look at the people with knowledge and wealth, and they say, man, if Allah only gave me that wealth, I would spend it the same way that they are spending it. I would give sadaqah, I would feed the poor, I would help the masajid, I would do these things because of the knowledge that it has taught me to do these things so I can earn the pleasure of Allah, but I don't have it, I wish I could have it. Allah would reward that person because of their intention the same way that He rewarded the man with knowledge and wealth. 
And then you have the third type of person who has wealth, but he does not have knowledge. And he spends his wealth in a way that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He goes out, he's ruthless with the way he spends his money. In extravagance, on things he doesn't need. He doesn't give, she doesn't give, you know, that wealth to the people who have responsibility upon them. They're using that wealth in a way that is displeasing to Allah. And, Allah, and the Prophet ﷺ says, these are the worst type of people. And then you have the fourth individual who has no wealth and no money. Sorry, no wealth and no knowledge. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being amongst these types of people. He says, this person with no wealth and no knowledge, they will look at the person with wealth and no knowledge and say, man, I wish I could spend money like that. Man, I wish I could spend my money like that. I wish I could do that. And brothers and sisters, watch your social media. Because these thoughts might run through your head in scrolling and looking at other people's lives and how they're spending their wealth and how they're spending their money. And you're scrolling through social media and you're looking and saying, I wish I could do that. Watch yourself. إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ And then the Prophet ﷺ says, that person who wishes they could do that, they will be punished the same way that the third category would be punished. Because it's the intention. Right? So just because we can't do something, you know, and we long to do it, and we have the desire to do it, and if it did you know, present the opportunity to do it, we would do it, it is as if we've already done it. It is as if we've already done it. Number three, determination not to return back to the sin. So who can, who can give me the first two? Who can give me the first two? You. This one right here, she's taking notes, mashallah. She's like 11 years old. How old are you? How old are you? You're 11, mashallah. Look at that. You're 11 years old, mashallah. You're taking notes. Okay, you're shy too, mashallah. Al haya shu'batun min al iman, mashallah. Yeah, go. What's the first one? Uh, the one with the wealth and the knowledge. Okay, good. You're 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 giving me something else, but good. I know you're paying attention, mashallah, alik. Go ahead. Uh, regret. So the brothers they say regret. The first step in order to have our sins forgiven is to have remorse and regret in the heart. Number two, sisters, yes. Uh, to immediately cease from committing that sin, immediately. To, so, to stop immediately. This. The third is what? To have the determination not to return back to the sin. When you think of tawbah, when you think of tawbah, consider all segments of time. Now time generally is broken down into three segments. What are these segments? Past, present, and future. In order for our tawbah to be accepted, we have to consider each segment of time. Number one, past. Past refers back to what you mentioned, young man. Regret. You have to have regret for that which you have done in the past. As for the present, you need to stop immediately. Immediately. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not after Hajj. But you need to stop immediately. And that is a result of the, 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 the regret and remorse that you have. That is what leads to the cessation of the sin. And the future, which is determination not to commit the sin again. Now, brothers and sisters, why do the scholars, they, they make the statement determination? And they don't say, stop doing the sin. Why isn't the condition, stop doing the sin? Why is it determination? Why? Because that's all we have. The only thing that is holding you back from committing sin is your determination to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that determination is driven by your Iman. And as we know, Iman, it goes up and Iman, it goes down. So when your Iman is down and your Iman is low, it is very easy to fall into sin. If you have a determination and you're sincere and you have regret, then you have fulfilled those conditions of tawbah. Because if the condition was stop the sin immediately, then guess what? None of us would be forgiven. Stop it and don't commit it ever again in order for that sin to be ex uh, you know, uh, expiated, in order for that sin to be forgiven, we would never be forgiven. Because sins, many a time, are what we call addictions. People suffer from addiction. Brother says, Achi, stop smoking weed, I'm addicted. Stop smoking cigarettes, I'm addicted. Stop drinking, I'm addicted. Stop watching pornography, I'm addicted. I'm addicted, I'm addicted. You say, well, okay, you need to go make tawbah. So he goes and he makes tawbah. But then he goes and he falls into that sin once again. The question is now, is that initial tawbah rejected because he fell into the sin again? Yes or no? Of course not. Because at that time when he was making tawbah, he was determined. Ya Rabb, I will never do this again, inshallah ta'ala. I'll never put myself in that situation. But then he or she falls victim to the situation again. That does not negate or erase the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had initially forgiven them. And that is why, brothers and sisters, tawbah is a way of life. It is a way of life. It is something you have to deal with for the rest of your life. Because you will continue to sin for the rest of your life. So who can repeat the first three for me very quickly? You got them? Who can repeat them? Go ahead. Regret. Regret. Remorse. Remorse. Stop this in what? Immediate. Immediate. That's very important. Uh, and determination, to not return. determination. Determination not to return back to that sin. If you have that, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. And it doesn't matter what sin you have committed. When we sin, we transgress against ourselves and we transgressed against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there's a third category, and that is a transgression that extends to others. When you commit a sin, you are wronging yourself and you are wronging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are also situations when we commit a sin where we don't only wrong ourselves, we don't only wrong Allah, but we wrong others in the process of committing that sin. And this is why the scholars have added a fourth condition. Some of these sins can be sins such as backbiting, slandering, rumor mongering, um, theft, assault, and even uh, murder, you have wronged another individual. You have taken the rights of another individual. And brothers and sisters, know and understand that on the day of judgment, it is not only between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is between you and al-alameen. Everything. The Prophet sallallahu he teaches us that, you know, he asks his companions, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا muflis? Do you know who the bankrupt individual is? If I ask you that question, you'll say, yeah, the bankrupt individual is the person who has no money. They have to claim bankruptcy. They have to go through the court system. And all of this, it's a really bad situation to be in. That wasn't the, you know, the thought of the Prophet ﷺ. He wasn't talking about real, he wasn't talking about the, the, the bankruptcy of the dunya. You know, the simple bankruptcy that anyone can, you know, subhanAllah, claim bankruptcy, mashid had. But he was talking about the real bankruptcy. 
The real bankrupt individual is that man and that woman who on the day of judgment, they are resurrected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them back. And he brings them to account. And that person has salah. And that person has siyam. And that person has sadaqah. They have so many good deeds. But there's a line of people who have been wronged by that person. Backbiting, you know, slandering, physically abusing, assaulting these individuals. Did you forget about these people who you wronged in the dunya? So they will come on the day of judgment and they will begin to take your salah. You know, you come to the halaqa today, they take the halaqa where they're at the movie theater right now, chilling, maxing, and relaxing. They're taking your ajr. You go and you perform hajj, they take your hajj. You give sadaqah, they take your sadaqah. They take everything until you're absolutely left with nothing. But that's not the end of it. Because there's still people who you have wronged. And there's still a line up out the door. So what happens? They have no more good deeds for them to take from you. So what do they do with their evil deeds? They put them on you. You didn't rob. You know, you prayed. This guy, maybe he didn't pray. So he's going to give you his evil deeds. Until you're carrying their burden now. All because you did not take care of the rights of the people. So the scholars, they mention, in order to, you know, eradicate these types of sins, you have to follow the first three steps. One, two, and three. But on top of that, you have to uh, pay restitution to these victims. And that depends on the type of sin that was committed. The way that you give the rights back to these individuals depends on the type of sin that was committed. So if I was backbiting a person, for example, then either I have enough you know, courage to go up to that person and say, you know what? You know, yesterday I was with a bunch of guys or I was with a bunch of girls. And we were sitting there and we were talking and your name came up. And, you know, I said something really bad about you. And then she's like, well, what did you say? You know, I said this and this. And then all of a sudden you see her get angry. If you know that that's going to cause more issue, then you go back to the gathering in which you spoke ill of that person. And then you speak well of that person. You speak good of that person. You know what? Yesterday we were talking about Fulana. We were talking about her. But in reality, I was thinking about it. Number one, we shouldn't have been talking about her. And number two, that's not who she is. That's not who she is. Right? So you have to go back. And you have to rectify that. If you, you know, take something from a person, then that has to be paid back. You know, if you rob something from an individual, that has to be paid back because that's their right. Either you give it back to that person or you compensate them for something of the same value. This is how you clean up your sin. You take care of it. Don't say, inshallah, Allah will forgive me. No, Allah will forgive you because the sin is between you and Allah. But when a third party is involved, you have to make sure you take care of that third party. The last thing that I would want is for all my hard work, all my efforts to be taken away from someone who I don't even like. <laughs> that's the last thing, that's counterproductive. So we have to be very careful. So now who can quickly summarize these final four, these four things? Brothers and sisters, Wallahi al-Azim. If we live by these four conditions, every single day, every single moment, we will be happy people. We will live a better life. We will live a happier life. We will be more content with who we are as Muslims. We won't be so difficult on ourselves. Who can give me these four? Number one, go ahead. You have to have regret. Go ahead. All of them, buddy. Go ahead. And you have to stop immediately. 
And then you have to have the intention and determination not to do it again. And number four? Exactly. To pay the rights back to the people. How old are you? Wallahi, I wish when I was 11 I knew this. Wallahi al -Azim. I wish when I was 11 years old, I knew this. Because this is life changing. This is life changing. You have a head start, young man. Alhamdulillah. He's never going to forget these things, I promise, because I mean, I'm making him feel good right now. Right? He's never, he's always going to make tawbah. Alhamdulillah. He'll always make tawbah. He won't forget. Inshallah. Tayyip. So, you know, mashallah, you've given us these four conditions. That's great. I want to repent. I want to do what you've been sharing with me to do. I want to follow these steps. But deep down in my heart, I'm asking myself, will Allah actually forgive me? Will Allah actually forgive me? Take these points into consideration. Number one, the idea that Allah will not or cannot forgive you is greater than the sin that you have already committed. Right? If you believe in your heart that Allah will not forgive you, or you believe that Allah cannot forgive you because your sin is greater than the mercy and the maghfirah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is a greater sin than whatever sin that you have already committed. Because now you are negating the power, ability, mercy, forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let that be the first thing that comes to mind. That nothing I do, no sin that I commit is greater than the mercy and generosity and love and care that Allah has for me and my well-being. Nothing. Number two, the desire to repent is a sign that Allah wants to forgive you. Because to repent is to be guided to something that is good. And this is why Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri, he says, any person who follows these four conditions, Wallahi, they will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people around them say, how can you make such a bold statement? How can you say for sure Allah will forgive them? And then he goes on to say, because Allah would never guide somebody to tawbah, except that he was also willing to forgive them. There's no way. Allah would not guide you to the thought and to the desire and to give you that regret in your heart to turn back to Him except that He wants to forgive you. And that He loves to forgive you. Sometimes we think that Allah is like man. That when you make a mistake with man, they'll pardon you once, they'll pardon you twice, they'll maybe pardon you three times, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth, they will not forgive you. That is man. We're not talking about man, we are talking about Allah. And that's what makes him a tawwab And that's what makes him Al-Ghafoor. And that's what makes him Al-Rahim. That's what makes him al Afu. He's not like you and I. That he continues, he continues to forgive you happily. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to forgive you? You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish you? You think he has it in for you? You think he wants to see you, you know, burn? People always say this, Allah doesn't love me, he wants to see me in the hellfire. Yani the Prophet وسلم, in, in a hadith uh, uh, narrated by uh, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. After a battle, they're, you know, gathering the, the, uh, the prisoners of war. And there's a woman who has been captured. And she's lost her child. And she's looking for her child. Where is he? Where is he? I can't find my child. And then all of a sudden she sees her child and she runs to that child. 
And she picks up that child and she immediately begins to suckle that child and fulfill the needs of that child. The Prophet ﷺ, he saw this all. The companions, they saw this all. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he looks at his companions and he says, do you believe that that woman would ever cause harm to that child? They said, never, Ya Rasulullah. She would never hurt that child. And then the Prophet ﷺ puts everything into context. That Allah, Allah is more merciful on his servants than that woman is to her child. You think Allah has it in for you? Allah wants to see you succeed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see you prevail. He wants to see you overcome that sin. This is why there's a direct connection between you and him. Don't go to the imam. Don't go to your friend. Go straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will forgive you. The man who loses his camel, he lost everything. He's sitting now. He's hopeless. He goes to sleep. He finally wakes up. He sees the camel. He shouts out to Allah, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my servant. He mixes it up. He mixes it up. He's so happy, he's so content that he says, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my... He mixes it up, you know? He was, the Prophet ﷺ said, This is the feeling of Allah when his servant comes back to him seeking pardon and forgiveness. Who are you dealing with? Who are you dealing with? You're dealing with Allah. He will forgive you. He will forgive you no matter what you have done. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not despair ever. No matter if the world points their finger at you and calls you this and calls you that and belittles you. Don't you ever despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that was the case, do you think that the companions would have entered into Islam? Many of the companions fought Muslims and killed Muslims with their own hands. But it was through their tawbah, al-awda wa ruju' ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that made them men and women that we talk about today and we take as role models. Never despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I end today's halaqa uh, inshaAllah ta'ala with this. So you say, okay, I will follow these four steps. I will have regret. I will, you know, refrain from committing that sin immediately. I will have determination and a pure intention not to return back to the sin. And if I've taken the right of another person, I will pay that right forward. And I believe now that Allah will forgive me because I know who He is. I know who I'm dealing with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you repent. One day passes, two days pass, but there's still pain in your heart. You're still feeling that pain. And then you say to yourself, did I not make tawbah? Did I not... Follow the proper steps. I went to the class. I wrote it down. Why do I still feel this pain? And immediately you associate that pain with Allah not forgiving you. You associate the pain that you still feel from that sin and you say that pain is only there because Allah has yet to forgive me. No, Allah forgave you. The moment, the moment you fulfilled those conditions. But the reason why you feel pain is because you've assaulted yourself. You've wronged yourself. If somebody, going back to the example I use, punches me, laceration, blood, and then they come back to me and they say, you know what, I was out of line. I'm so sorry, forgive me. 
and I forgive them. I've forgiven them because they're sincere and they regret and they have remorse and they'll never do it again and they'll never do it again today or tomorrow. But does that mean the pain has gone away? No. There's still blood gushing. My eye is still swollen. I can't even see. Similarly, our sins, they assault us. And they cause pain to us. Physical pain. And that pain is only there as a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because then, when you think of committing that sin again, you say, hey, is the desire or the fulfillment of the desire that I have in committing this sin worth the pain that I will feel afterwards? That pain is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now you say, before thinking and indulging into that sin, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. A moment, a moment of, of you know, fulfillment is not worth days of pain and agony and frustration and lack of iman. It's not worth it. So this is the mentality. Even though you have forgiven, you have been forgiven, the fact that pain still resides in your heart and in your body is not a sign that Allah has not forgiven you. But rather, it is a sign that sins cause pain. And they affect us. And they hurt us. And this pain will teach us in the future to refrain from falling into that sin once again. I hope inshallah ta'ala that through these steps, we can always turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, there are people who will only turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once in their life. And that is when they're being brought into the masjid and being prayed on for their janazah. That is the only time they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas we as men and women believers, we have the opportunity to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he mentioned in the beautiful hadith أَكْثَرَ مِنْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةِ فِي الْيَوْمِ فِي الْيَوْمِ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةِ Never leave your tongue dry from seeking pardon and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In next class inshaAllah ta'ala we will talk about istighfar and we will talk about different ways that we as Muslims can make istighfar. And we will talk about the best way to make istighfar. And we will also, inshallah ta'ala, share some stories of the people of the past who took the step back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made al-istighfar. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, I want to thank you for coming in tonight.